me to arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Like this is shaking me that I'm looking around and I'm seeing the wicked. They're doing pretty darn well. They've not no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They're free from the burdens common to man. They're not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. The evil conceits of their minds know no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. In their arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how can God know? Does the Most High have knowledge? This is what the wicked are like. Always carefree, they increase in wealth. Surely in vain have I kept my heart pure. In vain have I washed my hands in innocence. All day long I've been plagued. I've been punished every morning. So stop right there. Asaph is saying, he's looking around the world and he sees injustice. He sees the wicked, I mean, not only getting away with it, but they're prospering. And he looks at his own life and goes, well, why have I been good? I just get nothing but punishment and plague. My life's not so good. As I look around the wicked, they're, they're doing okay. And then he goes on. And here's the real key point. He says this. If I had said, I will speak thus. In other words, if I had said, this is how I'm going to carry on in the world with this attitude. I would have betrayed your children. He's speaking to God. I would have been unfaithful to my fellow saints. When I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me. As we're talking about, it's hard to bear up with injustice. Till I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them on slippery ground, you cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, swept away by terrors, and so on. What Asaph is saying here, saying that the, the injustice in the world, the injustice I've experienced, the wickedness, wickedness seeming to be rewarded, it's oppressive to me. But then I go into the sanctuary. I come into a time of worship. And I get my perspective back. Don't we experience that? One of the blessings of coming to worship, we get our perspective for the upcoming week. It totally helps us. And this perspective that Asaph's talking about here is, okay, now, I, I'm just looking at right now. I'm just looking at a snapshot of right now. I've got to look at this from God's perspective, an eternal perspective. Okay, God is going to take care of this. God is going to take care of this. Rough for me now, good for me, good, good for them now. But I understood their final destiny. And his own final destiny, go down to verse 24. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. So Asaph found comfort in that. Keeping in mind that God is just, but being reminded in the sanctuary of that because he wasn't experiencing it in his life at that moment. That gave comfort to Asaph. And that same thought gives comfort to Paul and through him, He's seeking to give comfort to the Thessalonians. And that's our focus in the reading today. So now I'd like you to turn to 2 Thessalonians 1, the, um, the reading that, that um, we just heard Eleanor read, 2 Thessalonians 1. And we are gonna, we're going to walk through this, uh, the, the, readings, uh, the reading today, verse by verse. So I do want you to follow along. Page 1842. <coughs> so please open your Bibles. You'll get more, more from this if you're following along. Uh, and just, just to, to catch us up last week, last week's focus, Pastor Mark preached on verses 1 to 4, and I just want to pick it up verse 3 to give us the context. Verse 3, we ought always to thank God for you, brothers, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love every one of you has for each other is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. Pastor Mark talked about that last week, the faith and the love. And <coughs> excuse me, what Paul is thankful for here is that in the face of the persecution, in the face of the injustice, their faith is still growing. 
their love is still growing. Okay, that's what he's talking about here. And now we get into verse 5. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> verse 5. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right, and as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. All this, what? What is he talking about? He's talking about the fact that in the face of persecution and injustice, their faith is growing, their love is growing. <clears throat> and Paul is saying that is evidence that God is with you. That God is with you, that he has counted you worthy, you are his own. Now when he says counted worthy, he is not saying that you are earning this worthiness. The wording that Paul uses there, very, very deliberate. Counted worthy, that means declared worthy, that means it's given to you, it's by grace. None of us are worthy on our own. None of us want to face the justice of God on our own merits. And Paul says you are being counted worthy. God's grace is on you. Okay? So, so the, the point here is, is that a Christian facing injustice... It doesn't seem to get resolved. Facing persecution that doesn't seem to have any outcome that's positive. It would be easy to say, where are you, God? God, why aren't you helping me? You're a God of justice. Why aren't you doing anything? And Paul's saying, eh, God is at work. God is at work. And the, and the fact that your faith and your love are continuing and growing in the face of that is evidence that God is there, that you are one of his, and that the kingdom is yours. Very important point he's making. One of the main points of this whole letter is to encourage the Thessalonians in persecution. Remember when we studied Acts, when we got to this point, Paul in Thessalonica, he had to leave after a couple of weeks because of persecution. He left, he fled. The persecution continued on the church left behind. So he wrote 1 Thessalonians, and a few months later wrote 2 Thessalonians. We talked about that a couple years ago when we, when we studied 1 Thessalonians. Well, here, it's continuing. And Paul wants to encourage them. He's saying, hey, God has not abandoned you. And when you're experiencing this, and you're continuing in faith and love, that's evidence that God is with you. Evidence that you belong to him. You're one of his. He's counted you worthy He's kind of, so, the, so keep that in perspective. It's like Asaph going into sanctuary and go, oh, the big picture, okay. God has glory before me. And, you know, and Paul, in, in Romans 8.18, very, very important and familiar verse. Let's say that together, please. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us, Okay. Glory is coming, Paul is saying. You are counted worthy. Glory is coming. Now, I want to, back to 2 Thessalonians here, I want to jump ahead. I want to jump to verse 10. Okay? I want to jump to verse 10. Then we'll come back to 6 to 9. If we look at verse 10, it might help us understand just the severity of what he's talking about in 6 to 9. So verse 10, he's fleshing out what it means to be counted worthy, what the people have um, ahead of them. On the day he comes to be glorified, as Christ comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you believed our testimony to you. Okay, he's describing Christ's return in glory and what it means for those counted worthy. He will be glorified in you. Okay, this is the goal. That glory that we saw in Romans 8, 18, the glory ahead of us, it is Christ being glorified in his people. What, is, what does this mean? This is the goal. This is the end game. This is the product. This is what God's will has been for each of us, for every person on the planet. It's what we are made for. We are made for communion with God. We are made for a relationship with God. We are made to live in the perfect image of God's love, mercy, and grace. And that's what's going to happen. That's what Paul's holding before the Thessalonians and would hold before us in the face of the injustice that we experience. He says, no, what you have before you is 
Christ glorified in you. That means the perfection of Christ perfectly in you. You and me, we are to, intended by God, designed by God to be containers of God's glory. And on that day, gone will be all sin. Gone will be all selfishness. Gone will be everything that inhibits us from our relationship with God. All of it gone. And instead, we are perfectly reflecting God's glory and perfectly reflecting His image. This is what God made us for. Communion with Him, oneness with Him, connection, relationship. So Paul is putting before them, hey, think of what's ahead of you. Yes, it is hard now. Yes, you're experiencing injustice. Yes, you're experiencing persecution. But God has before you what he has made you for, his glory in you. Notice he doesn't say, we are glorified. It is Christ glorified in us. You know, so sometimes we think of heaven in, in what ends up being pretty selfish terms, you know, actually self-centered. Like heaven is some extremely super luxurious resort where angels are waiting on us and, and satisfying our every whim. I don't know. No, no, let's, let's, I mean, yes, it is every tear wiped away as we heard in, in the past in Revelation. Yes, it is all of those blessings and, and all of that. That's the result of Christ being perfectly glorified in us. It's Christ's glory. Christ's glory. And, and, if, and if it sounds more exciting to be at a super luxurious resort than Christ perfectly glorified in you, that's because we're still here <laughs> and we still have that fallen sinful nature. So that's, that's what we're, we're focused on. So Paul is holding that before the Thessalonians. Now, let's jump back to verse 6. What about, to put it roughly, the bad guys? What about the injustice? What about it? those who seem to be getting away with it? Now, back to verse 6. He says, God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. Reversal. God is just. A day of justice is coming. Those who have done evil will pay. And relief is coming. He's already talked about that. Relief is coming to you who have encountered worthy by God's grace. And this is based on what? Notice what Paul says. God is just. Paul is basing this on this fundamental piece of the character of God. God is a God of justice, and He will not abide in eternity in justice of any kind. And so Paul would, would hold this before the Thessalonians and before us when we see injustice in the world, when we experience injustice. Paul's saying, despite what you see, despite what you're experiencing, this is true. God is just, and His character demands that there will be an accounting. That there will be justice. That's why this notion of a final judgment, God coming, from we, we say in the, the creed, Christ coming to judge the living and the dead, is a good thing. It is God's justice. God's character. And so this is what's happening here. And then, then Paul goes on in the next couple of, of phrases to answer three questions about this, this visitation. He said, it, the questions are, when's this going to happen? Who's this going to happen to? And what's going to happen? So let's look at that. First, when? When is this going to happen? Middle of verse 7. This will happen... When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. Okay, so when Christ returns in glory, from thence he will come to judge the living and the dead, as we say in the Creed. That's why we say it in the Creed. It's very fundamentally true. But here's the frustration we want justice now, right? We long for it now, we ache for it now. 
And as God's people, it is incumbent on us to work for it now, right? And pray for it now. But we're not going to experience it in fullness now. Paul's saying, not yet. God's character is demanding His justice. But it's going to come when Christ returns in glory. And notice how he describes it here. This is not Jesus' meek and mild shepherd. Blazing fire, powerful angels. Here comes the judge. Okay? Bringing his justice. Who is this upon? He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Now, it may look like he's talking about two different groups here, but really he's not. It's a very Hebrew way of speaking where you say things connected with an and, but it really means the same thing. In other words, those who do not know God, that is, who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, those who have rejected, those who do not have that saving relationship with Christ. He connects it to the gospel. Why? Why? Because it is the gospel, the good news of what Jesus has done for us, the good news of God's grace in Jesus Christ. That's our lifeline. That is our life preserver. That is our hope. That is our only hope. As I said before, we talk about justice and longing for justice. I don't want God's justice on me for what I've done. None of us want that. Because God's law demands perfection. And we confess that every time we gather here that we are not perfect. We are fallen. And God's justice is punishment upon us. But the gospel is the power of God for salvation for all who believe. And so those who reject the gospel who oppose the gospel, Paul says, it's going to be a bad day. The picture is of, of like, like, like the shipwreck and we're out at sea in the water and, and, and somebody throws a life preserver and some grab on and are rescued, but others say, nah, I don't need that. I'll be on my own. Or down in a pit and a rescuer comes and throws down a rope to pull you out. and Instead, the person takes a knife and cuts the rope. I don't need that. The gospel is the rope. The gospel is the life preserver. The gospel is hope. It is peace. It is mercy. It is the good news of the cross. God's justice, his ju- He is just, demands sin be paid for. But the gospel is the good news that Jesus has paid for our sins. God's justice perfectly met in Him so that His mercy is perfectly showered upon us. So for those who have opposed it, who have rejected it, who fought against it, and you notice the way he words it here, obey the gospel. Referring to believing it and following. Living a life that is shaped by it. Those who are persecuting. Those who tell lies about God. Who oppose His work and His mission. What will happen? Verse 9, They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of His power. That's hard. Once again, it looks like two things, but it's really one. Everlasting destruction is being shut out from the presence of the Lord. We're talking about what the Bible refers to as hell. The Bible talks about it quite a bit. Jesus talks about it the most. And this, at its essence, is what it is. 
Remember we said we were made for communion with God. We were made to be containers of his glory. We were made to be shaped into his image. We were made to be one with him in living a life that perfectly reflects his glory and his image. And this is the opposite, to be shut off, lights out. And the judgment is those God saying to those who said, I don't need it, I don't want it. God saying, fine, you're shut out. You're shut out. The Bible uses a number of metaphors for this, lake of fire, uh, garbage dump, that's what Gehenna means. Uh, being in the ground with worms, whatever, the pretty gross images, metaphors, but this is the essence behind the metaphor. This is what that really is all about. It's shut out from the presence of God. It's the complete opposite of what we were made for. It's the complete opposite of what Paul talks about in the next verse, verse 10, about Christ being glorified in us. It's the complete opposite of God's will, His burning will and loving heart for each one of us. And it's sad. It's sad. And it's, it's, it, it's bothering, isn't it? I mean, isn't it disturbing to think about that? Disturbing to, if it's right here in the text, we cannot deny it. We are bound to the truth of the word, and it's right here in the word, black and white. And it bothers me. Does it bother you? But you know what that bothering is supposed to do? That bothering that this does, that, that, that it disturbs us, is supposed to be one of the motivations for us to try to make sure that number of people is as small as possible by supporting God's mission, by sharing the good news, by inviting people into the number of those counted worthy by His grace. So this is the, the, the picture that, that Paul is putting before the, the Thessalonians. God is just. You're experiencing injustice. You're experiencing persecution, but hang on. The fact that you're keeping your faith, growing in your faith, growing in love, is evidence that God, despite appearances, is at work in you. And I find it fascinating. Even today, in today's world, this has been true historically, and it's true in today's world, those places around the world which are experiencing the most persecution are the places in which the church is growing most rapidly. God's still doing this. He does it in our lives as well. So, so God is at work, and, and, the, and the longing for justice will be met. There will come a day when God's justice will be seen. I don't know what that means, what that's going to look like on that day. But this, the Bible tells us, is that on that day, Christ returns in glory, new heavens and new earth, Christ coming to judge, living in the dead, that we who belong to him, who by grace are saved, We'll look at that and say, God is just. Hallelujah. All praise to the Lamb on the throne. This leads Paul to pray. And that's what verse 11 and 12 is. Paul's prayer. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you. That our God may count you worthy of his calling and that by his power he may fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. You see what he's praying for? It's all about glory. It's all about, all this has been about glory. Christ is coming in glory. When he does, he will be glorified in you and me perfectly. Those who reject him will be cut off from the glory. But right now, Christ wants to be glorified in your life right now. And that's how we live. We live our lives that Christ will be glorified in us now. It's going to be imperfect because we sin, we fall short. But still, we just strive for it. And that's why Paul's praying for it. That we show ourselves worthy of his calling. That every good purpose of ours worked by God is carried out. Every act prompted by faith because these give glory to Christ, and he's being glorified in us. And I can't think of a better way to conclude our meditation than by making Paul's prayer our own. We pray. God, our Father, 
We pray for us here. That you may work in us to live lives that are worthy of your calling. We pray that by your power, every good purpose that you've worked in our heart, every act that's prompted by our faith, that you may be at work in them, fulfill them, bring them to fruition. We pray this, Lord, so that the name of Jesus Christ will be glorified, not just in eternity when it's going to be glorified perfectly, but the name of Jesus Christ will be glorified in our lives right now, in the way we live, in the way we speak, in the way we think, in the way we love one another, the way we serve one another, the way we, 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 we do life together. We praise you for your grace. In Jesus' name.